I'm Uday Mehta. Uh, uh, I want to start by thanking Roger Berkowitz and Bard College and the Hana Arendt Center for uh, putting together this annual conference. Uh, I, I can't think of how many of these conferences I've attended. Uh, must be six or seven. Um, and they are, in a sense, uh, the thing I look forward to as an academic more than anything else every year. Uh, and it is uh, Roger's uncanny knack, uncanny skill to choose topics of enormous current vitality. Uh, I've known uh, Roger for, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, we both taught at Amherst College together. Um, and uh, it's something I, I, I've always admired about him. Uh, uh, he's that kind of intellectual who has enormous breadth uh, and intelligence, as you just saw. Uh, but what makes Roger special is his, he has this unfailing moral center. Uh, and I think that's why he puts together these fantastic conferences. Uh, so thank you, Roger. Um, uh, I... Uh, 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 recently uh, was speaking to somebody um, that I was going to moderate this panel uh, with uh, Pankaj Mishra. And uh, uh, the person said, uh, is it the same Pankaj Mishra who is this global intellectual? And I said, yes, it is. Uh, and the person said, he followed it up by saying, ah, didn't he grow up in India? I said, yes, he did grow up in India. And I think what makes Pankaj so remarkable, among many other things, is that he grew up in India, and yet his stage is the world. And that is uh, what I think makes him uh, a true cosmopolitan. Uh, he is always speaking beyond the sight of his growing up. Uh, he is, uh, uh, in the best sense of the word, a cosmopolitan. Uh, and I think that is evident uh, in the range of his thinking and writing. Uh, He's written on the British Empire. He's written novels. Uh, 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 he, he, he divides his time. You do uh, still divide your time between India and in England. Uh, he's written essays on all sorts of important things. And he is, uh, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, he is uh, truly broadly educated. Um, uh, and uh, he's written essays, novels, uh, uh, thoughtful books. Um, so uh, it's truly an honor to uh, m invite him to speak to all of us. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, I look forward to your questions and engagements with him. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, um, Oday, for that incredibly generous mm. introduction. And thank you also, uh, Roger, for a very rousing uh, opening speech. Um, I have a terrible flu, I'm, I'm sorry to say. So um, if I uh, abruptly collapse into a fit of coughing, uh, apologies in advance. Um, when I was looking at the, uh, some of the literature that accompanied um, the invitation to this conference, there was a line I was particularly struck by um, 
the Hannah Arendt Center responds to the undeniable fact that rage and emotions are increasingly a force in our political and cultural lives. I think if I were to reformulate um, this sentence, I would replace increasingly with visibly because rage and emotions have always been a force in our political and cultural lives. And I think we probably be able to see them more clearly if we look at the potentially, and you know, actually, you know, sort of not just potentially, but generally volatile nature of politics in the non-Western world. Um, Hannah Arendt did not really speak about that much. Um, but I think it's actually, and for that reason, you know, I think it's necessary to go beyond her work to challenge some of the assumptions in it. And she's the kind of writer um, with whom disagreement is always extremely rich and, and rewarding. Um, I should, you know, definitely first of all mention, you know, my, my debt to her. Um, I never read her in any systematic way, never read her at university. But I came across her work, and I now can't remember in what context, uh, in the late 90s. And then I, when I look back now at some of the things I published in the late 90s, or early 2000s, I'm struck by the number of times I reference her or quote her, especially origins. And I think uh, this is because some of you might remember uh, this was a time when uh, a lot of media in Europe and America, the press, also the BBC, in the UK were carrying uh, laudatory accounts of uh, the British Empire and empire in general. We thought in India and many other places that the debate about empire had been settled far too many people in those countries and indeed many English, uh, British historians, writers, novelists had uh, defined it um, you know, definitively as a racist and predatory despotism. But suddenly in the early 2000s, so a lot of people in the mainstream press, um, I've mentioned the BBC, there was a cover story in the New York Times magazine uh, calling for an empire light. So empire became shockingly respectable again in a way that was truly unprecedented. And Hannah Arendt's writings came in very useful to me at that point because I was publishing in Western periodicals. And obviously it's not enough to uh, quote from anti-colonial or anti-imperial thinkers. And actually it's really surprising how few Western thinkers had dealt, uh, maybe Uday will correct me on this, as systematically as she had with uh, 19th century uh, imperialism and to connect uh, 19th century imperialism with totalitarian practices in the, in the, in the, in the 20th century. Um, I mean, I think she was one of the first European Western thinkers to describe how the dehumanization uh, of Africans helped create modes of thinking and action that eventually rendered a range of uh, people, Jews, communists, gays, uh, socialists, the disabled, as uh, superfluous beings uh, who can be disposed of in concentration camps. The second time, of course, she was very useful, and you know, by that time she was being widely quoted, I remember, in the mid-2000s uh, during the war in Iraq. Lying in politics became a text for, 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 for many of us uh, in what was, again, an atmosphere of suffocating intellectual conformity. Uh, you know, that whole line of uh, some Bush apparatchik uh, that, you know, we are an empire now and we, 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 when we act, we create our own reality. And the rest of you are reduced to studying and analyzing the reality we create. Uh, you know, that was, uh, when you read Hannah Arendt at the time, it was so extraordinarily resonant. Uh, uh, the things she had seen in uh, the problem solvers of Washington DC in 1971, you know, the deadly combination of the arrogance of power, the arrogance of mind and utterly irrational confidence 
in the calculability of reality. But to read Arendt now, 14 years after the financial crisis, decade after Occupy, nearly a decade after uh, Narendra Modi's election in India, six or seven years after the twin explosions of Brexit and Trumpism, um, you're forced to confront some of the limitations of our thoughts um, because what these political earthquakes have revealed is an enormous uh, pent up uh, emotional energy, uh, a kind of near simultaneous rise of demagoguery uh, across the world, uh, the weakening of ethical constraints everywhere under the pressure sometimes of public opinion. Uh, we've seen what used to be called uh, Muslim rage, uh, remember, you remember this phrase from the 2000s, uh, something that used to be identified with mobs of brown-skinned men with long beards is suddenly manifest globally. Uh, you see it among saffron-robed Buddhist monks in Myanmar. You see that in, 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 in among white nationalists in, in England and in this country. Uh, racism, misogyny on social media has uncovered um, what Nietzsche, speaking of the men of Rezontimo, called a whole tremulous realm of subterranean revenge inexhaustible and insatiable in outbursts. And again, I mean, it's, it's uh, Roger spoke a little bit about, but it's, I think uh, it can't be stressed enough just how extraordinary the situation is because when you think about how religion, tradition have been steadily discarded since the late 18th century universally in the hope that rationally self-interested individuals can form a liberal political community, you know, which can define its shared laws, ensuring dignity, equal rights for each citizen, irrespective of ethnicity, race, religion, gender. But these basic premises of secular modernity, um, which we used to think are really threatened only, you know, amongst uh, Muslims or some other parts of the world, are now endangered by elected demagogues in the very heartlands of secular modernity. So again, you know, does how, in what ways does Arendt, Hannah Arendt help us understand this? Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons um, why we might struggle to understand uh, some of this with her concepts of the laboring, of, of thinking, uh, collective action, all these particular notions that are um, very distinctive about her thought is um, because her you know, preoccup preoccupations were very different at the time uh, when she was writing. You know, origins appeared, interestingly, just as decolonization, the second great revolutionary upheaval since the French Revolution was getting underway. But it's interesting that Hannah Arendt was interested in 19th century imperialism but she was not interested enough in decolonization. The problems of billions of people entering mass politics after the collapse of European empires, people full of strong, even extreme emotions of rage and resentment over their degradation, and I'll come back to this later in this talk, they were going to define the future. They are in fact defining the, the, the present today, uh, if you think for a, for a second about uh, the way uh, Russia is, is, is behaving today or, or the way China uh, manifests its nationalist uh, resentment of the West, the, Chi the way this particular narrative of 100 years of humiliation by the West has become core to Chinese um, identity today. Um, and this is all, you know, in, in many ways, a consequence of what started to happen in the late, in the mid 20th century when Origins was published. Um, there's, a, there's actually a very good line from Irving Howe, one of Arendt's, uh, you know, I think acute critics who wrote in 1954, the revolutionary impulse has been contaminated, corrupted, debased, demoralized, but the energy behind that revolutionary impulse remains. Now it bursts out in one part of the world, now in another. It cannot be suppressed entirely, 
everywhere except in the United States, millions of human beings, certainly the majority of those with any degree of political articulateness, live for some kind of social change. These are the dominant energies of our time, and whoever gains control of them, whether in legitimate or distorted forms, will triumph. Hannah Arendt didn't really manifest much interest in the institutional forms the striving for social change or better economic conditions might take. Uh, for instance, what role will the state take in the project of developing and modernizing you know, large parts of the world? Uh, what will provide the basis for social cohesion in these new nation states? All these questions that you know, a lot of people in the non-Western world were grappling with. Like many Cold War liberals, uh, although Hannah Arendt was not one of them, uh, she was more concerned to understand the unprecedented dangers that totalitarianism posed to what she saw as a Western tradition of democracy. So it was left to largely to anti-colonial thinkers to probe the connections between capitalism, imperialism, fascism, totalitarianism. It was left to them to challenge claims of Western civilizational superiority uh, and to mobilize widespread feelings of indignation and humiliation against um, colonial violence. And of course, uh, continued colonial violence even after decolonization. The one time Hannah Arendt was forced to confront the decolonizing world was in the 60s when a lot of thinkers actually at that time were forced to confront it because of Vietnam, uh, because of what happened there, because of the futility of the American effort there. And then of course, um, the civil rights struggle in this country, uh, the increasingly militant forms it took. Um, and I think you know, Hannah Arendt's response to that was a deeply conservative one. Uh, deploring violence in, in the third world, uh, even though she did approve of it in, 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 in other contexts. I think she could do, you know, uh, I mean, let's not be too critical of her because um, at that time and even later, American British thinkers, European thinkers felt no great need to grasp what was going on in different parts of the world, what would eventually shape the world, they had no idea. They could still work with ideas and concepts drawn from, you know, the European past, um, from ancient Greece, from ancient Rome, and societies that didn't have that particular intelli intellectual heritage could be judged, could be even dismissed as backward. But I think if you work exclusively with Roman or neo-Roman uh, American models, you're going to make it harder for yourself to understand non-Western societies. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Hannah Arendt's account of the public sphere, uh, her admiring descriptions of the American Revolution, uh, it will be very hard if, you, if those are your bases to make sense of the cruelly hierarchical societies of Asia and Africa, for whom modernity uh, was synonymous with the values of the French Revolution, which Arendt deplored, uh, the values of liberty and equality. Um, so I, I, I think um, the ideal of equality, the ideal of liberty, which Arendt slightly belittled, belittled as an aspect of the social question, is a moral and political sentiment, uh, and it's important to emphasize the sentiment, that modernity unleashed with some uniquely destructive power, especially in materially uh, deprived societies. And this is why I want to you know, talk a little bit about my experience of uh, growing up in, in, in India. I'm glad um, uh, Uday mentioned that because in, in many ways that's been at the basis of much of my thinking about um, much else. I, I could never allow myself any illusions about the role of reason uh, or, or you know, reasoned deliberation in, in democratic uh, society. Uh, because I always experience political life as fundamentally unstable, even uh, even violent. Um, but I should also say that you know I'm not a, a you know political theorist or for that matter a social scientist of any kind. I mean I started out as a novelist, and I've tried to make sense of my own experience mostly through 
through literature in, in, in even the books that are, I've written that approach social science in some way, my main guides have been uh, novelists and, and poets. And if I have any analytical framework or model, it's one that's built around individual dreams and desires and, and fantasies. And I think hatred, jealousy, resentment are not just moral categories, uh, they reveal the human psyche in its fundamentally unstable relations with the external world. And moreover, these emotions are shaped in particular cultural, social contexts. And the range of them uh, can, can, can vary enormously, you know, not just the fear of losing honor, dignity, status, uh, which is a fear that grips many people today. The distrust of change, uh, the appeal of stability, uh, the lure of vanity, a fear of appearing, uh, of appearing vulnerable, and indeed the lure of uh, identity uh, conferred by um, backwardness uh, and the, you know, the pleasures of, of victimhood. Um, so a range of emotions are, have been you know, very, very active in, in, in political life. Um, and I think uh, it's been really hard for me to understand a worldview where uh, human beings are defined through their traits of rational egoism, um, where politics is seen as something you know, that um, impersonal elites, technocrats, experts devising hyper-rational schemes of progress conduct between, uh, between themselves. And this is, um, again, because of this particular experience, and I want only to talk about a couple of them. One was actually my first political experience of going to university as an undergraduate in a city called Allahabad in uh, the, the most populous state in India, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, this is 40 years after India became free and democratic. And um, Allahabad used to be a city that used to produce a certain kind of ruling class for, for the country. Uh, some of the big leaders of the anti-colonial movement came from there. Um, the university there used to be called the Oxford of the East. Um, and it was a place where a certain kind of elite consensus was, was, was manufactured. And this was the case for a, for a very long time. Uh, you know, families, uh, very Anglophilic, often educated in the UK uh, at, at, at Oxbridge, uh, coming back, if not going into politics, going to university, um, and really, you know, forming part of a very dominant uh, ruling class. By the time I got there, the place was in turmoil. And what had happened there was that um, a lot of people from nearby rural areas had started to arrive in the city. Um, they wanted a proper education, and they were enrolled at the university. And the university was losing its elite uh, 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 character. And I think uh, I should also mention the elite was predominantly uh, upper caste, in addition to being upper class. And they were being challenged by the time I got there, challenged often uh, violently. Um, so they were banding together, the upper caste groups were banding together, the lower caste groups were coming together in their own kind of um, uh, organizations uh, or informal uh, groups. And uh, there was a lot of fighting, there was a lot of contest. Um, the solidarity, identity, uh, they were all constructed in each group around the identification of the other as, as, the, as the enemy. Uh, there were battles on university campus, pitched battles sometimes. Um, and what united all these disparate groups, people, students from um, these particularly rural areas, was a profound loading of the old metropolitan English-speaking uh, elite. Uh, when, when Roger spoke about the, the, the sort of hatred of hypocrisy or hatred of uh, the the, the so-called liberal elites that unites large parts of the population here. I was thinking that was almost my sort of fundamental political uh, experience, uh, this, this sort of rage against uh, an entitled elite that had monopolized for itself all the main opportunities of um, social and educational uh, 
uh, mobility and, and advancement. Uh, this, I should also say, this loathing of the elites has been most effectively weaponized by the current uh, Hindu supremacist regime in, in India. So what I'm trying to say is that I experience political life um, as a, from the very beginning, as, a, as an unstable and volatile contest of power between different groups, almost a kind of existential struggle in which emotions of fear and, and, and resentment are always um, dominant. Over time, those emotions have become more widespread and intense, and I think it's because of the global dissemination of the ideologies of um, individualism and meritocracy, very much American ideologies um, that have you know, spread globally. Um, and I think what the contradictions uh, they have revealed is you know, that if there is formal social and political equality, um, such as there is in, in, in democracies like India, um, but if those if that formal social and political equality starts to coexist with massive differences in power, education, status, and property ownership, you're guaranteed to have, at some point or other, uh, volcanic eruptions of rage, hatred, and, and malice. Um, I, I, I mean, I could explain a little bit more, which is that the society that I grew up in in India was still relatively isolated it upheld a quasi-socialistic project of collective welfare, you know, public ownership of goods. Uh, individualism was very much frowned upon. But in the 1980s, all this started to happen, started to, cha started to change dramatically. And the idea then was that equality and lib dignity and liberty were to be realized through individual initiative in, in, in free markets. Um, so the idea of this society, a universal society of self-interested, rational, autonomous individuals uh, became suddenly, suddenly very dominant um, and was, was you know, internalized by a, a very broad sort of Indians. And of course, there was a new common sense accompanying this notion. Um, issues of social justice, equality became secondary. Uh, the figure of the freely desiring, choosing, self-inventing individual became uh, more important. And of course, in this conception, the individual was fully responsible for his failures as well as his triumphs. Uh, the historical injustices uh, ceased to matter. The idea was the slum dog too could be a millionaire. And the individual's failure to escape the underclass was evidently due to his wrong choices in a competitive uh, marketplace. So in you know, all of these things, which you obviously we've experienced um, in various parts of the world, were particularly dramatic in, uh, in, in, in India. And what happened um, simultaneously with it, especially in the last 10, 10, 15 years, uh, I'm sure some of the speakers will go more detail with this, but I do want to mention was the arrival of digital technologies. Um, which obviously has um, enhanced the human tendency to constantly compare one's lives with the lives of the fortunate. And especially in the Indian context, women entering the workforce or being prominent in the public sphere, which has become a very common source of rage for men with uh, siege mentalities. But the, but the biggest, I think, change that has happened has really altered public life in, in, uh, in India is the arrival of uh, the smartphone, which for hundreds of millions of people is their first simultaneous, simultaneous experience of a camera, computer, television, music player, video game, e-reader, the internet, all combined for the very first time. As a whole timeline of technological advances in the West, uh, which took centuries, you know, from the invention of letterpress to photography, radio, television, personal computer, the modern. All of that has been compressed into just a few years. Uh, and you know, without the social political revolution that accompanied these technological leaps in the West. You know. 
Um, so, you know, for instance, here, rising middle class that was empowered by the printing press began to crack open the exclusive world of a tiny uh, literati. But in India, something, a much more drastic shift in class power has happened because, as Roger said, and anyone with a smartphone possesses the means to express an opinion and disseminate it far and wide, not only bypassing the traditional uh, elite of political representatives, technocrats, and opinion makers in the media, um, but also confronting them. Um, and I think, uh, obviously, you know, fake news, uh, which is really completely reshaped uh, uh, politics in India, has transformed it, I think, decisively uh, for the rest of our uh, lifetimes because of the sheer volumes of in, in, uh, uh, disinformation, uh, which has such a misleadingly uh, persuasive uh, texture. Uh, it seems the same as, as uh, information. And uh, you know, the result is the weakening of uh, anal anal analytical ability, uh, you know, the capacity to distinguish between the essential and the inessential, truth and, and untruth. And if you have a context where education is already uh, you know, very poor, uh, it's largely a, a, a con, and competition is fierce for even menial jobs, uh, then conditions are ripe, not for a revolution, but for a mass exodus into the smartphone screen. So, you know, politicians who are very adept at it, such as the Prime Minister, Indian Prime Minister Modi, uh, benefits because politics has blended with entertainment. So campaign commercials, Modi uh, uh, sort of tributes to him, um, they, they, they flash forth from the same portable, portable uh, screen. So there has been also a great degree of um, depoliticization, you know, kind of, uh, 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 it's, a, it's in a depoliticized spirit uh, that the like icon is clicked on, on Facebook or Instagram and, and, and Twitter. Uh, there's another aspect of the sociopathic uh, behavior um, enabled by smartphones, which is the you know, explosion of, of uh, pornography. India is the third largest market for online pornography, much of it uh, extremely uh, violent. Um, but I think the, the, the sort of addiction to fake news, images of sexual degradation, I think uh, are mere symptoms of a deeper and manifold crisis in India, which is provoked by premature and rapid shift from linear text to screens, from critical thinking to passive consumption, and from writing to um, image making. I mean, you know, if the social contract in, in democracies depends on a broadly shared vision of reality, uh, then w what's gonna happen if systematically manufactured and manipulated images come to constitute a whole new alternate reality? Obviously, this question now uh, is a big one, even in largely literate and secular societies uh, in this part of the world. But it's particularly urgent in, in partially literate and intensely religious societies where myth and magic already have a strong grip on human imagination. And the habits of rational thinking are skin deep among many in even the country's um, best educated uh, elites, uh, even, you know, even, even scientists. Um, you know, in many ways, the history of the West uh, records how uh, images of religion and myth came to be challenged by writing or rational thought or historical consciousness, uh, scientific knowledge. In this role, in this account, um, reason plays the role of the iconoclast, um, shattering the rational power of religion and myth with its impersonal analytic tools. But in India, this, this march of progress had barely got going and in fact has now been rapidly reversed um, because man-made myth transmitted through Facebook and WhatsApp rather than objective reason has emerged as a true iconoclast. Um, so the smartphone also has helped amplify the fundamental emotion of our time, uh, which I think is ressentiment. Um, if and which is true uh, that we all inhabit a world where elaborate theories and promises of individual freedom and empowerment 
have collided uh, disastrously with um, you know, a deep store of individual discontentment with the actually available degree of freedom. And I think this is the fundamental contradiction um, that we all grapple with today. And that is what has scope opened up this vast scope for Ressentimo. As long as we were living in these post-colonial societies with projects of collective welfare, things could be controlled, managed uh, to a certain point. But now living in a global society with its uh, ideologies of uh, endless freedom, endless liberty, um, and at the same time realizing that actually the, the means of realizing those, those, those fantasies are extremely, are becoming extremely limited. This is what has, has, has sort of encouraged, stoked this existential resentment of other people's being, uh, an intense mix of envy and sense of humiliation and powerlessness, and a kind of impotent hatred. And of course, uh, a, a, a sort of fruitless pursuit of, of, of vanity uh, the desire to secure recognition from, from others, to be esteemed by them as much as one esteems oneself. Of course, the problem is that this kind of vanity is doomed to be perpetually unsatisfied because it's just too commonplace, it's too parasitic on fickle opinion. Uh, so it ends up nourishing uh, uh, dislike of one's own self while stoking a kind of impotent hatred of others. Um, and it can quickly degenerate into an aggressive drive whereby individuals feel acknowledged only by being preferred over others and by rejoicing in their abjection. Um, as, as, as Gore Vidal once put it, it's not enough to succeed, others must fail. Uh, a sentiment that's really truly gone global and you see it manifest even in, in, in geopolitics today, um, certainly in the way uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin is, is, is behaving. So Rissontimo uh, poisoning civil society, undermining uh, political liberty uh, is, is I think making for a global term to authoritarianism and particularly toxic forms of um, chauvinism. So the, really the question if we, if we agree with this um, is why have we struck to, stuck to old explanations of political behavior that idealize political regimes in the West and have given an exaggerated role of reason <coughs> in social, exaggerated role to reason in social, political, and economic life. Why have we for so long and so studiously ignored uh, the undeniable fact that in any given mass society, life chances uh, are unevenly distributed? that there are permanent winners and losers, a majority dominates the, 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 a minority dominates the majority, and the elites are prone to manipulate and deceive. Um, of course, you know, many, many people here were forced by the terrorist attacks of 9-11 to reckon with conditions in the, in the, in the global south. Uh, the, the fact that political rage over inequality within and between nation states had simmered there for a long time. But at the same time, you know, the, the atrocity looking back left largely undisturbed the vision in which a global economy built around free markets, competition, and rational individual choices would mitigate ethnic religious differences and usher in worldwide prosperity and peace. Uh, and any obstacles to the spread of Western liberal modernity, such as Islamic fundamentalism, would be eventually eradicated. Of course, you know, it turns out today that uprooted Muslim fanatics are relatively minor threats to uh, liberalism and modernity. Um, fanatics and by bigots have been empowered in the very heart of the modern West as a direct consequence of the most sustained experiment in individual self-interest and free marketeering. Um, I think, I mean, Roger has asked for solutions to this. Um, I feel as, as someone 
who writes about this issue, I can only try and rephrase the question in a, in a different way rather than provide or attempt to provide solutions. Um, I feel that we cannot carry on in the old way, of course, define the crisis of democracy globally through the reassuring dualisms of the past, you know, whether it's liberalism versus authoritarianism, uh, Islam versus modernity, or even reason versus rage, I think it may be more rewarding to think of uh, democracy itself as a profound, profoundly, as a profoundly fraught emotional and social condition. Something that has been aggravated by the triumph of the ideology, ideologies of individualism and has now become universally unstable. If we do this, I think it will at least allow us to examine political rage across different regimes and classes today and maybe also understand just why it has become so politically consequential and, and, and toxic. But for that, of course, we will have to tear ourselves away from our devotion to the canonical texts and figures of Western thought and look more closely at the experiences of non-Western societies. Um, I'm going to end with actually one of my favorite sentences in Hannah Arendt's work, which um, supports this sentiment. It begins, if the solidarity of mankind is to be based on something more solid than the justified fear of man's demonic capabilities, if the new universal neighborship of all countries is to result in something more promising than a tremendous increase in mutual hatred and a somewhat universal irritability of everybody against everybody else, then a process of mutual understanding and progressing self-clarification on a gigantic scale must take place. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. Can you people hear me? Can you hear me now? Uh, so, Pankaj, thank you for that very thoughtful uh, lecture. I, I, I want to start by asking you, uh, at various points in your lecture, uh, you invoked this idea uh, of the bankruptcy of, let's just call it, Western ways of looking at this. Uh, whatever we're talking about, the this is. Uh, are there alternative, for the time being, non-Western thinkers who you think deal with this in a different way? Uh, I'm speaking to one of them. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't say bankruptcy. I would say inadequacy. Because obviously, that tradition is enormously rich and, and, and incredibly uh, useful in understanding you know, certain political traditions, philosophical traditions here. Um, but it's only when they turn into kind of self-sufficient totalities like, you know, I mean even Hannah Arendt's uh, invocation of the Western tradition, uh, and in fact there are several Western traditions. Um, and I think this is, you know, partly a function of the, um, partly a consequence of the, of the Cold War, and you know, also the assertion of uh, non-Western peoples and societies and their politicization. Uh, that certain genealogies, certain intellectual genealogies of the, of the West were constructed, and I think it became harder and harder to see how those particular traditions and particular systems of thought could help us understand um, you know, the non-Western the non experience. 
But, you know, I think to answer your question, I feel like we're only in the first phase or it's only really only started 10, 20 years ago where uh, people inspired by, you know, some of the sort of foundational texts of this kind of thinking, such as, such as liberalism and empire, your book, who are now, you know, starting to both question the dominance, the hegemony of this particular Western tradition and also, you know, offering alternative modes of thinking about this. The problem is, and you will come up against right away, is that so much of that thought has not been systematized. It doesn't quite come with the same set of academic intellectual protocols. Uh, it doesn't quite exist in the same way that you know, whole Western political tradition exists in, in you know, entire libraries. Um, you have to go sometimes to politicians. You have to go to a figure like Gandhi sometimes to understand that. And nobody would claim that Gandhi was an academic or that he wrote for uh, a, a specialist audience. He was very much a, 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 you know, an activist who uh, came up with all kinds of original ideas in the course of his political life. Um, but that he would one day also be seen as a political thinker, that has really only happened in the last two or three decades. Uh, and there are other discoveries to be, to be, to be made uh, in Chinese political thought and, and, and elsewhere, uh, where we begin to understand the intellectual genealogies of these particular countries, their traditions of statecraft, their modes of understanding international relations, for instance, you know, what were China's relationships with its neighbors, all of this, uh, it's still in the process of uh, being, uh, being discovered by modern scholarship and, you know, of course, being systematized and presented in a way that is acceptable uh, within, within, within academia. I was hoping you would mention Gandhi <laughs> because I, I think he is very relevant to this discussion. Uh, one is because uh, he doesn't privilege reason. Uh, 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 I think uh, he doesn't privilege uh, reason and instead, I think, uh, he privileges things like courage uh, or patience. Uh, uh, and uh, as Roger was talking to me about this conference, um, I kept thinking, you know, uh, I, I wish uh, there was some kind of Gandhian who could participate in this because he or she might be uh, the relevant contrast to this rage, uh, et cetera, you know. Um, so thank you for mentioning. No, absolutely. Uh, let, let me also just mention, I mean, I think um, I was thinking of Gandhi, in fact, while I was speaking um, in the context of Hannah Arendt's suspicion of imperialism as really creating, laying the ground for totalitarianism. And Gandhi is very explicit about this, you know, saying that fascism is essentially the, 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 the twin brother of of uh, Western imperialism. And Nehru says something similar. A lot of anti-colonial thinkers are saying this at least two decades before Arendt, Arendt wrote her. I mean, we have to give her credit for actually right. you know, making those connections. But the other thing that brings the two together is their shared suspicion of the Hegelian historicist tradition, uh, where Gandhi had no trust in history as, as, as providing any kind of uh, guidelines for the present or, or indeed for the future. Are there uh, questions from the audience? I really liked um, uh, your speech and how you unpacked the problems 
in our modern world, but I would like to know what you propose, because it seems to me that the brain, our brain, human brain, has not evolved uh, more or even to catch up with our, with our uh, modern way of communication that makes it possible to be not personal, to make it so easy to be, uh, as Roger said, f you know, facetious or, or um, you say lies and it doesn't even, even get anywhere. So how do we get out of it if we don't understand how our brains work, meaning that if we have any kind of fear, and that means whether we are politically way up there or not, how can we get to the knowledge that, no, we're all connected, and we think we're connected by our social media, but we aren't really. I think our human connectedness is, is inhibited by social media, because we can get away with not being personal. So what are we going to do about it? Um, I honestly had no um, clear answers to that. Um, I do think, I do think that a politics um, that recognizes the role of emotions in both private and, and, and public life assumes them to be central. Um, and you know, when you think about it, the success of demagogues, I mean, people like Trump or Modi or Bolsonaro has really been based upon a politics of emotion, of extreme emotion. Um, and, and, and their opponents have struggled to come up with a convincing repose to that because I think they're too trapped, too beholden to uh, their faith in reason and rational deliberation and that what, what I, th I find it's, they find or they seem to find it difficult to understand is that the reliance on reason creates a certain kind of hierarchy which will eventually be resented. Um, I mean, this started already in, in, you know, in the late 18th century or the early 19th century when people were talking about the role of reason. They were already saying that a lot of people out there who are not capable of reason. You know, the enlightenment valorization of reason came with this you know, proviso that there are a lot of people who are just completely immune to reason. Um, I think we haven't really tried a politics of, of, of emotion that is not aimed at stoking uh, anger and malice uh, and hatred, uh, but you know, aimed at encouraging the values that you just mentioned of, of compassion or solidarity or, or you know, the feeling of inhabiting a, an interdependent world. Can I jump in here and uh, ask you, uh, there are, after all, different conceptions of reason. Uh, is that relevant here? Yes, I think um, you know. Obviously, in the Buddhist tradition, mm. uh, reason has a has a has a great place, but it's not it's not instrumental reason. It's a reason that is not, in a way, uh, being used for specific purpose. It's a reason allied to the facts of interdependence, of human inter interdependence. And again, sort of aimed at encouraging, you know, feelings of, of, uh, of, of solidarity and sympathy and, and compassion. Um, the problem with objectifying reason and setting it above the other, all the other emotions Thinking of reason as a way to understand the world, to master it, in a way, in a way, it's it's it, it's this is when it starts to become problematic. Um, you know, obviously, people have blamed reason for all kinds of things, but not without good reason. I mean, people have connected reason to the to 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 the concentration camps. Yeah. Um, you know, those are also the extreme manifestations of a certain kind of 
instrumental reason. And I think it is because reason has been, become so detached from, or is, or is seen as something too detached from, from, uh, from emotions. Or even opposed to it. Hello, um, thank you for the lecture. Uh, it was excellent. Oh, I just, um, in your talk, hello, over here. <laughs> in your talk, you were talking about uh, the influences of individualism in world history, um, and especially in the interaction of India coming to terms with Western whatevers. Um, my question for you is, could you put into words your differentiation of that trend of individualism and the individualism that you talked about at the beginning of your talk, which was this kind of, uh, you called it uh, poetic um, ethics or that kind of thing, the basing your morality off of an individual's dreams. Yes, thank I mean, you. That, that, that contrast, um, I, I just remember it was very striking to me. I mean, I remember that moment and it was very rapid, very dramatic, that transition from inhabiting uh, a, a society that was largely defined by collective aspirations um, and the collectivity was dominant, you know, the family was important, the community was important, uh, the, the, the political group that you belonged to was, was important. And this idea that you have some unique self within yourself to express, to bring out, uh, which is, you know, a, a very commonplace idea here, was received by many of us as a novelty and it's, it's through that individual self-expression that you become fully modern and you come to inhabit uh, the, the modern world as a, you know, as a, proper, as a proper citizen. Uh, we'd constructed thought of modernity quite differently. Um, so this was, a, this was a great and disorientating revelation uh, for, for, for many of us and also for many, a deeply corrupting one because what it led to was uh, obviously, you know, some people who were already privileged, materially privileged, to uh, embrace these new opportunities of self-advancement, of self-expression. They took those opportunities. Um, at the same time, they started to undermine or attack these older traditions, political traditions. Like someone like Gandhi was widely mocked. Like, this guy has nothing to teach us uh, what he was basically teaching us was poverty. Do you all want to be collectively poor or at least work towards a society where some people get rich first and then you know, money trickles down? So all this stuff, you know, trickle down, uh, Reaganite, Thatcherite versions of uh, individualism, this sort of broad assumption that Thatcher articulated there is no such thing as society or, you know, versions of that started to arrive in India and they had a revolutionary uh, impact, not just in India, China's you know, another, another place which started to receive these uh, ideologies in the, in, the, in the 1990s. And um, that really completely challenged older ethical systems, older uh, worldviews, and while displacing them, really left nothing in place apart from these very ruthless, immoral, you know, uh, ideologies of uh, individual striving, achievement. Uh, someone like V.S. Naipaul, you know, became a very central figure in all this, um, you know, because he generalized uh, his own life experience of coming out of nowhere and becoming a successful and famous writer. Um, and he was very influential in India in the, in the 90s and 2000s with this sort of, you know, notion of the famous lines from A Bend in the River, the world is what it is, those who are nothing, who allow themselves to become nothing have no place in it. So this sort of bleak vision of the world became mainstream. And that was really, uh, that was really a huge shift. Uh, and in that context, that's why I was trying to say, uh, when you realize that the opportunities for self-expression or individual advance advancement are so limited, and only really reserved uh, for you know, a small number of people in a very hierarchical society, uh, then the possibilities of ressentiment, the possibilities of a demagogue exploiting those widespread feelings of ressentiment are going to be greater. And that's precisely what, what, what happened in India. 
So, so it seems to me that we're talking about rage, which comes from the individual. And we're talking about reason, which to me sort of sounds like value judgment. What reason is reasonable? Who gets to decide what reason is reasonable? So it seems to me that the two issues that we're talking about, and while we're fo focusing on social media, I, I think establish a system that we have that can't be changed, right? We're living, whether it's in, quote, democratic Western world societies or even in some autocratic societies, in republics. It's representative government whether it's autocratic or democratic or somewhere in between. And I think the problem is that when you have representative government, the individual's emotions cannot be addressed in any way other than rage. So therefore, what we have to do is rethink our systems. And it's been impossible since the French Revolution to effectively have a system that is political and not representative until now. And we now have an opportunity to change that. And so the first thing I think we have, and I'll get to my point in a second, but the first thing I think we have to ask ourselves is, what is it that we want to change? Is it that we want to have an elite group of academics decide what reason is and somehow disperse it into the world through teaching our students? which will only continue to result in what we have today, but in a different style, or do we change the system? And so I suggest that as blockchain becomes more and more useful, that we scrap the whole idea of republics. The question we're gonna have to ask, is it a globally, is it a global world? Is it a geographically political world where we have countries that have their own borders and their own homogeneous, Societies except the United States, which is not a homogeneous society. But once we decide that, or the world decides that, what if we just gave everyone a token that they could elect to vote on, on any issue from their home, from their computer, from their smartphone, and we don't have a representative form of government? Now, I'm not sure what this looks like. I'm not sure how we deal with it. And we do need to have some people, unfortunately, make certain decisions about values, like what are the 20 commandments of things that you can't vote against, right? You can't vote against killing people, you can't vote against some other things that we decide. But if everyone has a chance to voice their opinion, then there won't be rage, or there shouldn't be rage, unless someone comes in to undermine their ability to express their emotions through a direct democratic vote, not through Republican form of government. That's what I have to suggest. Pankaj, uh, when you were answering that person's uh, question, it occurred to me um, uh, there is this line from Gramsci uh, where he says, uh, the old is not dead, the new is not born, and in the interregnum there arise a lot of morbid symptoms. Uh, and I, I've often been struck by that, and in the context of this conference, I'm wondering, are, are we in some interregnum, and is rage one of those morbid symptoms? Um, the intensity of that rage, the destructive uh, consequences it has already had, is definitely forcing us to do a lot of rethinking of the kind uh, the gentleman over there uh, suggested, because almost everything is up for grabs. Yeah. Everything is up for uh, revision. Um, and this is, again, an unprecedented situation. I mean, we are looking at nothing less than a certain kind of end game for modernity, for secular modernity. What takes its place? What kind of political institutions? Uh, what kind of economic uh, policies we can adopt 
in order to not accelerate the destruction of the planet, first of all. Um, it's all really, in a way, we are tasked to think through all these problems. Uh, so, I mean, in a way, the conference, uh, perhaps, you know, I don't, maybe the last few conferences have always also uh, revolved around this theme, but I can't think of a moment uh, of greater urgency, intellectual urgency, than the one uh, right now, because just about everything that we grew up with, everything we took for granted, everything we assumed to be true and enduring has uh, started to fade away or started to collapse. And we're not quite sure what will take its place. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> I'm asking because when in your talk, um, when you talk about the place of reason, it, it made me think I've been in and out of the army since 72, so I served during Vietnam. I was on the border, uh, east-west border during the Cold War. I was a tank commander in the 70s, and, and then I went to Iraq in 2009 and 10 with a, an aviation unit. And, you know, looking back on it, it we had been without a land war in Europe until this year, but we've been at war since World War II in different places. And it seems like rage has an awful lot more place in global affairs recently, e even since World War II. And is there, is there any way to to get reason a better place than it has right now with Russian tanks and missiles falling or attacking um, Ukraine? <laughs> um, actually, I don't, I don't know whether rage um, is really the, I mean, I'm sure it, it, it's, it's there. Um, but actually, one of Hannah Arendt's uh, ideas is quite, uh, is, is quite useful in understanding uh, Putin's maneuvers. I think the idea of image making, uh, where you don't actually have a very clearly defined military objective, uh, but you go to war as uh, the, the Lyndon Johnson administration did in the 1960s to project an image of yourself as um, universally potent and respected, and someone, uh, an entity that ought to be respected if it is not, and you're gonna bomb the hell out of some, some country uh, in order to project that, uh, uh, that image. So the lack of you know, clear objectives or sometimes uh, what looks like, what look like ever-shifting objectives in Ukraine, uh, indicate that what really is foremost on his mind is the desire to project an image of Russia or of, of Russian uh, uh, potency and, and, and that can be impressed upon his, Russia's immediate neighbors. Rather than rage itself, um, I think uh, that, that particular notion, that particular fantasy of um, impressing your neighbors, impressing um, a, a particular country with a spectacular display of force uh, has failed. And, and the more it f uh, uh, fails, the more desperate you get, the more desperate you get to, to, to you know, in your sort of image making project. So you, you know, seek more and more uh, extreme, you look out for uh, more and more extreme things to do and that's, what, that's also what is happening and that's also what happened in uh, Vietnam and then the bombing of, of, of Cambodia. I mean, related to this question, uh, I don't think uh, that rage was an important part of the Second World War. There was anger, uh, there was a sense of tragedy, but uh, 
I don't think it was rage. Rage typically doesn't have a clear object. Uh, uh, I, I, do you agree with that? So I would like to ask a question about gender. In, in your book and in your talk today, you mentioned males resentful against women working. And, and I'm wondering, in, in the traditional Indian society before individualism, was there a community where sexuality could be expressed without domination? Or is that just an essential form of domination in human societies? Well, there wasn't really. I mean, obviously, a uh, different uh, situation amongst pre-modern peoples or indigenous societies where you would find um, surprising amounts of gender equality, but not in the modernizing sectors of the population, not in the urban, uh, you know, the situation wasn't uh, good at all for women in the in the sort of, let's say, uh, the, the decades before uh, the, the 1980s or, or the, when the big changes started to happen, women were confined largely, you know, to to uh, to, to the, their, their homes, uh, to the kitchens, most specifically. And in fact, the revolution of individualism in in India has been, and this is, you know, the interesting thing about it, it has actually benefited a great uh, number of women in the countries, allowed them to uh, venture out of their confinements and, you know, become uh, actors, um, political actors, work, join uh, offices, industry, services. Uh, many more women have emerged in the public sphere but obviously this is seen as a, as, a, as a great threat by men who had monopolized uh, these positions in the past and really do resent the, 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 the presence of uh, women uh, in, the, in, the, in the public sphere. And you know, that explains a lot of the horrific violence that um, periodically erupts uh, against, against women in, in, in India. Um, so I think this, I mean, you know, all the uh, disadvantages of um, ruthless ideologies of individualism in, in places like India have to be balanced by also recounting some of the benefits uh, it has brought to, you know, large part of the Indian population. Uh, and, not, and also not just women, also, you know, people from different classes, some of whom were able to actually cut through uh, cruel hierarchies and find a place for themselves in, in, in the larger world. Um, so it's been hugely beneficial for them. I would count myself as one of the, one of the beneficiaries of that, very much so. Um, hello. So my question is, based off, based off of like the political issues that we have now, can you undefine, I mean, can you like, you not define rage and reason just because of, you know, the people that we have in control of our government now might not have the same mental process as people back then, meaning, you know, why we have laws changing now and why, you know, things around, around our sorry, environment are evolving and why we have you know, for example, Black Lives Matter and all of the marches that we have compared to how they were back then. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, uh, Black Lives Matter and, you know, part of a continuum of social movements, political movements um, around the world which have emphasized um, historical injustices or structural injustices um, have been very useful in kind of breaking away from these older paradigms of, of thought. Um, one of the problems with enshrining reason at the center of political life was, uh, I think, the illusion, the, gen the illusion that was generated that a lot of these problems from the past had been settled 
that the dominance of reason itself or instrumental reason was evidence of that. The eruption of um, deep-rooted, long-simmering historical anger over inequality, over racism, has you know, really unsettled those, uh, those old paradigms. And one reason why you know, people meet those demands for justice today with unhinged accusations of wokeness and so on and so forth. Um, because for this ruling class, which had claimed to have reason working on its side or had armed itself with, with reason, this is something too disconcerting. This kind of emotion is, 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 is too challenging. Um, and I think they really cannot really deal with it apart from you know, trying to delegitimize it in, 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 in some way or other. So it has been, I mean, I think it's had been uh, you know, tremendously useful. And I think you know, for thinkers also to look at the role of uh, extreme emotion uh, amongst human populations that have been uh, historically disadvantaged. Perhaps one final question from the live stream. Um, so the question is, can you say more about formal equality versus material inequality as a source of rage and perhaps the charge of hypocrisy? Is it possible for elites to feel ressentiment? Um, by formal equality, I mean, you know, just as in, in a place like India, uh, one man, one vote, that establishes a certain kind of you know, formal equality that the rich person's vote is, is as good as mine uh, if I'm a poor person. But if that kind of formal equality is mocked by extreme modes of material inequality, then it starts to make nonsense of the formal equality. And at some point, the contradiction will become a source of anger and disaffection in that society. And especially in a context, uh, especially in a context where equality is to be pursued through these newfangled means of individual entrepreneurship, free markets, this, you know, how do you become equal? By becoming richer um, and joining the rich. So if this is the way you're gonna pursue it and then you find that the means for that pursuit are lacking, uh, that will, end up creating or deepening you know, this, this, this reservoir of, of uh, resontimo, which would have been you know, smaller in, 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 in the past. Uh, when you didn't have all these other modes of thinking and, and action, and you know, society was still defined largely by collective aspirations or, or collective demands and, and, and needs.